Welcome to Genuine Life Recovery. We're here to help you and your loved ones overcome addictions and other addiction-related mental health challenges. In this show, we dive into the physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual aspects of addiction, mental health, recovery, family dynamics, codependency, and more. You can listen on your favorite app or at jodystevens.org. Genuine Life Recovery is made possible by great friends like Joshua's Heart in memory of Joshua Brent Moore, bringing hope, love, and awareness to those afflicted by addiction online at joshesheart.org and Jody Stevens Productions for commercial voiceover, narration, production, MC, and public speaking online at jodystevens.org. Hey friends, welcome back. I'm Jody Stevens, and today we are talking about trauma, in particular sexual trauma and abuse and how it impacts us, not only in our early childhood, but throughout our entire lives and also how we can heal. So while my guest today didn't necessarily turn to addiction or substance use disorder to relieve that trauma, that is often the case. And so I like to talk trauma on this show and its impact because it does touch every area of our lives. So my guest today is Cindy Benezra and Cindy suffered sexual abuse for years by her father at a very young age. But the great news is that Cindy found healing. She found hope. She's sharing her story today. She's written a powerful memoir called Under the Orange Blossom, which I can't wait to read. And of course, in the memoir, she shares her story. And today her mission is to be a voice to normalize speaking about sexual abuse, to give hope to others so that you can know that if that's your struggle, your story matters, that healing is possible. She's also founder of Cindy Talks, which is a platform where she talks about healing tools and stories of hope for trauma survivors. And she's a co-founder of a luxury event company, which is very cool, and lives in Seattle, Washington with her husband, and they are the parents to four adult children. So Cindy, thanks so much for joining me. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you, Jody, for having me. I love Seattle. My parents met at Pullman University in Washington oh. and um, just love hiking in that area, Olympic National Park and all mm-hmm. that stuff. In fact, my whole my mom's side of the family all lives in Yakima, oh, <laughs> which yeah. is not that pretty, but <laughs> that's where all the apples come from. So yeah, 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 true. Mm-hmm. So did you guys get, so at the time of this recording, did you get pummeled with snow in Seattle? Uh, no, actually, okay. Maybe, okay. Maybe, we had some snow, but it's, um, it's like the usual amount of snow. It's nothing, it wasn't jaw dropping and it didn't stop or freeze the city. And we're not used to being in snow here. So like a few inches is, is manageable, but um, yeah. I always find it amazing that in other places where it doesn't rain very much and I go Uh and travel there and I'm like, why is the traffic so slow? It's just because you just don't know how to drive in different climates. I know. You know, that it was Portland. That's where Portland got oh, hammered Portland. with snow, not Seattle. So that's what it was. I was thinking it was Seattle. So yeah, for you guys, it was probably just, oh, look, we have more rain than normal. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Cindy, thanks for being willing to share your story and to discuss trauma. I think it's so important. Trauma wires our brain differently. Like from a young age, it can cause us all kinds of mental problems, physical problems, emotional problems, um, Mm -hmm. addictions, just so many things. But a lot of times I think people come out of trauma, right? And they think there's something wrong with them. And really it's like everything you're experiencing is sort of a normal reaction to trauma, you know? And so healing's possible. It just takes time and some work, right? Mm-hmm. Definitely. I think it's a it's a journey if you choose to go through um, different healing journeys. You know, it's like yeah. a it's a built it's like building stones in it. As you unfold one, then you realize there's something more in it. And I think it's just sort of like it reminds me of of the evolution of just being human. We yeah. think we know it all, and then as we unfold, we're like, oh, we, I really don't know anything, and we teach, just keep on evolving. And I think healing is a lot like that. There's no magic pill. There's no magic bullet. There's there's not a prescription. It's just time and kind of um, perseverance and trying to find ways to heal that suit you. 
Yeah, yeah. And really just looking at your story and personal reflection and, and doing the deal. Um, so I, I commend you for that. It is a hard journey, but it is so necessary and there's so much beauty on the other side. Absolutely. So kind of give me, oh, sorry, you're going to say something. <laughs> no, absolutely. There is so much beauty on the other side. I think that's kind of, uh, that was sort of a, like an epiphany as a kid, just thinking like, if I could just only make it, if I could only survive, like oh, I can't, wow. I just have to survive just to make this it, because there is so much beauty on the other side. Wow. Yeah. Oh, goodness. And so much of our coping strategies and reactions to trauma are trying to survive. You know, we're, we're doing what's right at the time. Right. And then we get out into the real world and we're like, oh, wow, that thing I was doing doesn't really work in, in, the, in the world where this trauma doesn't exist, you know. And so then we can have this shame and beat ourselves up. But really, it's we're, we're coping in a way that probably saved our life at the time, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I think so, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. So give me your 10 minute version, 10 to 12 minute, whatever version of your story. Obviously, our lives are long. Our stories are long and involved. Mm -hmm. But where you were then as a child, what happened to bring you to this point now? And then we can kind of backtrack a little and talk about some of the story and coping strategies and healing and all that stuff, too. Okay. So, um, Let's see here. Um, I'm uh, born into a family of two immigrants. My dad's German, my mom's Mexican, and wow. um, Middle America and in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, they were very, very hard workers, um, sometimes held two jobs, three jobs, um, just to make ends meet. And um, the, I just remember always having parents that were constantly trying to excel. And my dad uh, eventually got his uh, master's in engineering. And my mom was sewing in the middle of the night because she's a seamstress. And she was sewing in the middle of the night to make extra money. And, you know, I just, when I think about my life um, before I had, um, well, let's just say this. I always thought my life was pretty normal. I knew it was really weird, but I thought I lived a fairly normal life because you don't know what goes on behind closed doors. And um, so I'm 60 now and way back what? in the seventies, no yeah, yeah. way back in the seventies, you know, it was kind of a little bit of a beaver cleaver family, you know, to, yeah. it, you never talk about dark secrets or anything that happens behind closed doors. And I remember things that would happen in our household. My mom would say, what's what happens in our household stays here. Oh, we never gosh. share anything. We don't share it with relatives. This is our life and it's private. So do not share anything other than what you had for dinner or basically that's kind of like how I it was instilled in me. And mm -hmm. I even noticed that I was even careful with like sharing with aunts and uncles and um, outside family because my mother was so um, particular about what did you talk about? What did you say? I mean, she would kind of quiz me on that. So, um, but basically uh, my story uh, about my abuse and trauma is that um, my dad was a very narcissistic man and a very domineering one and we lived in rural arizona so very isolated from family um and from the age of five to ten he sexually molested me and um how did that happen without anybody knowing is beyond me i think a lot of it was um parents or a mother who really didn't want to see what was going on in the household. Um, I don't, I don't know what happened to my teachers because I had bruises on myself. I think I fell through the system. I did share it with certain people. I got put into a shelter for a while with my mother and my sister. Um, once I told about what happened and then my father promised that, um, he would never hurt me physically because that's what all my mother could see. And my hymen was intact. I had no broken bones. So I got put back into the household. Neighbors never said anything, even though it was obvious, I would think. And also the school district just kind of 
it was just a broken system and we really didn't have a whole lot happening. Um, we just didn't have a lot of resources. And in fact, I think about yeah. the shelter that we went into people, it wasn't, um, there wasn't a, sh- a shelter or a, even a sexual abuse um, kit at that time. So we were just kind of mixed in with different people. And um, so those were just new and upcoming laws. So I can see how I fell through the through the cracks, though. But um, I forgot about what happened to me. Um, my dad's a true pedophile. And I forgot about what happened to me because at the age of 10, I started going through puberty and he was no longer interested in me. And um, so I was able to kind of recreate myself since I had a break from this trauma. My dad just kind of left me alone. And um, as far as I knew, I had a normal childhood until I had flashbacks. And in my flashbacks, I was 16. I lived overseas um, from Arizona. I moved to um, Iran. And then after Iran, there was a certain cutoff age where we had to go to boarding school. And in boarding school, without my parents, I was able just to kind of recreate myself. And I just blanked out, forgot about my whole life. All I knew was Barbie dolls and swimming pools. That's all I knew. That's <laughs> I only remembered the good things in life. And um, later on, when I started to become sexually active, it was just about 17, um, did I start to recall my past and it came in the form of nightmares and fragmented nightmares and i journaled and i journaled my whole life back together in little in these fragments and with this journal i basically took um my journal and i decided to write later on in life um under the orange blossoms my book and my perspective of what it was like to go through as a 16 recalling my history and looking at my parents and then feeling suicidal because I couldn't even cope with the daunting darkness that had, that I just kind of hid and it just started to unravel and I just didn't know what to do. So that was sort of, that's the premise of my book is like Mm -hmm. how I went through that and then my journey of healing and what I wanted to do from there. Wow. Oh my goodness. So what were the kind of flashbacks like? I mean, what was that experience like? Did you think you were losing your mind or what? (laughs) I really thought I was losing my mind. And I would go to my mom after Mm -hmm. a while because I had so much in my journal. I'm going, I would tell her, I said, I think I'm going crazy. I'm having these dreams. Um, and in and I in my book I share that experience where I told my mom like why am I having these dreams about dad and my mom just kind of shuts down and she was mm. reading a book at the time about Mary Queen of Scots <laughs> and I remember hugging her and saying mom I think I'm going crazy I'm dreaming dad's you know like touching me at night and then. She just started on, do you want to hear the story about Mary Queen Scots? And she just was telling me the story. And I thought, oh, no. And it was sort of a verification that it was true, that these dreams were, because who does that? I mean, I I don't know. I even knew at 16 that that was just like a big clue that this was reality. And then when I confronted my father, it was a lot of the same thing too. Um, He was like, did you read it in a book? Did you see it in a movie? Um, Are you ill? Are you okay? Um, And with like this huge performance, um, I think I realized that's when I looked into his big blue eyes and I thought, oh no, he is lying. This is, this is really true. And I think that's when I fell in through such a deep um, depression, because I realized the people who I thought were, I had an idea of what my parents were like. I knew I didn't like my dad, but I had such, I felt betrayed by my mom, let's just say that. Yeah. And I thought my protectors, these people who have provided a wonderful life for me, um, have failed. And my reality was blown and shattered. And I realized like, I didn't know what to do, who to trust, how to trust myself or how to even want to like get up the next morning. And so 
tragically, I wanted to jump from my window every day and I practiced jumping from my window, thought about it and would think about like, well, what if I jumped and would do the pros and cons about jumping and killing myself in a foreign country. And I know this sounds ridiculous, but I was just terrified of going to a foreign hospital. And my mother kept on telling me that they never would have the best care um, as they would in America. So that's what actually prevented me was getting like a secondary disease. But, but um, what if I survived and I was totally mangled? You know, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, I remember. But it's I not funny. Phone. We're not laughing. At, you know, it's just sometimes you have to look back and 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 laugh at sort of these things because it's part of the healing process. But um, wow, right. I continue, and um, it it was it was pretty eye opening, and so from there. I started like this whole journey on how can I heal because I decided I would, I, I want to live, even though I felt like I wanted to die. And the only reason I wanted to die is just because I just couldn't believe that I came from this lifestyle. Do you think your mom ignored it or shoved it down because she felt trapped? Like she had nowhere to go. She was an... Because at that point, where was she from? Is she in, was she, did she immigrate here? And you know, so she just sort of pretended it didn't exist to to make it okay. I think my mom was. Um, I think she was codependent, and yeah. I think she did a lot of things to. Uh, she was. She lived a life in denial, and yeah. um, and I recognize that even as. I, it just is who she is. It, I just recognize that she was always just in denial, even with her health. She would try to find somebody to give her the right answer about her health or switch doctors. And I did. So a lot of the yeah. things that she did, it was just, I would just kind of look at her and just go, huh, okay, you be you, but I'm going to be me. Um, yeah. I also have to tell you this, that I was a very feisty teenager. So um, I used to always think that I was born in the wrong family. Like I was the alien in my family. And how did I get these parents? So it was always that constant struggle to like, well, how did, how did I get in this family? So I thought it was yeah. a mistake. So it was kind of just a weird, horrible time in my life, but it really did set me on this journey. And I do have to say, I did think about drowning myself out and because in Spain there was an, a, a drinking age and I remember thinking about just drowning myself out in I don't know what whatever it could be but I realized that wasn't the solution and that's not where I wanted to go and I know that um, statistically people who have suffered um, sexual abuse sexual assault or anything like that in their life um, usually turn to drugs and alcohol it just it, it just didn't, I don't have an uh, addictive personality and I bet you mm-hmm. that that could be possibly it, but I think I just challenged myself. I just kind of chose how do I be the opposite of my parents? Yeah. And so that was kind of like where I started from, like my baseline. Did you struggle later with making decisions and things like that? What's interesting a lot of times about abuse and trauma is you're you're explaining to your parents what happened to you and they're invalidating it. So your instincts say, well, I know this happened, but I'm being told it's something else. And so sometimes later in life, we just have these challenges where we want to trust our instincts, but but our, but we've been told from an early age that our instincts were wrong. Did you find that it was a challenge for you to, you know, second guess every single thing that you did or thought because of that? Um, it wasn't my parents. I think it became everybody everybody yeah. it they were i just uh, my trust issues i and i still struggle with yeah. trust issues that is an uh, um something that's just the the downfall of of what happened and i still struggle with that and it's from what i've learned from therapy it's more like it, it goes into the attachment and mm-hmm. the trust yeah. levels betrayal that type of thing and what i found was really interesting and i think maybe um, maybe you could, I think anybody coming from a dysfunctional family, um, 
when it's reading your room, reading your audience, reading the person, you become um, almost like hyper vigilant, and you start yeah. to kind of look at the person, and it's almost like I'm not going to say psychic, but that's like the best word I could describe it. But you really start to read everybody around you. You look and you get in a room and you observe really quickly. And after a while, you know, by the time you hit your 50s, you're pretty good at it. I mean, you walk into a room and go, oh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of weird energy in this room. And I think uh, yeah. that was- So you kind of went the opposite way. Instead of shoving everything inside it, ignoring your instincts, which is what I did. I wasn't sexually abused, but came from a very codependent home. Like, don't feel that way. Stop feeling that way. So I stopped, you know? And so I would uh, shove all my instincts, whereas you kind of went this hypervigilant, like, mm -hmm. you know, because with trauma, we just believe the world's not safe, right? And of course, we know the world's right. not really safe. But you know what I mean? You yeah. grow up and have this- this because the people that were supposed to create a safety for me, they betrayed me. So so your brain's literally wired that way to where we're like, the world's not safe. I got it. So it sounds like you were more hyper vigilant, you know? Right. And eventually I decided that that didn't serve me either. <laughs> so I, I kept on, I, I had to find a way to stop reading people, stop looking at them and just kind of go with the flow because obviously... Yeah. I'm an old lady now and I'm going to be perfectly fine. I'm, I got, you know, I, I know what's right and what's wrong and I know my decisions and I know who I am now, but it was a, it was a gift. And then at same, same token, it was almost like a curse where I had to say, okay, stop, stop doing this. Yeah. Just like, just like live life and then make good choices with that. But it took a lot of, a lot of therapy. I have probably done therapy since I've been 18 years old. I mean, it's just been ever. And honestly, I can tell you almost every kind of format, it, it would take hours just to go over how much <laughs> different types of therapy I have an alternative different kinds of therapy and yeah. my experiences with therapists. Um, I didn't realize that even, that if you're with a therapist and it doesn't work for you, like you could actually just say, hey, this is not resonating with me. Can we just try something else? Or yeah. like, geez, I've been with you for like half a year and I think I've kind of, I'm ready just to try something different and can we end from here? And a lot of times I found my best referrals from therapists. It's not like it's yeah. a marriage, like you're getting a divorce. It's like yeah. you have control of this. So I found that to be even an experience too. It, that, that, that's good. And I think anybody with challenges, we all go through that because we go into the therapy and we sort of look up to the person or or they call it like transference, like this therapist is like my dad or a lot of those issues will come out. But I always think with, with therapy, I always tell people, just, it's just like a product. It's like any other. And they know that too. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so they're they're usually, if they're a good therapist, they're more than happy to say, look, I may not be the right fit for you. Um, I think what your challenges are going to be for this person or to see this person. And, and so to think of it as a product. But it's very hard at first because I've been through that when we're super wounded and you call and a, one therapist doesn't work out. <laughs> you know, and you get triggered all the way back to childhood. And you're like, you, you have to to kind of grieve through that and then just find another therapist but that is very hard and I wish they talked about that more and explained that more to people um but they don't <laughs> you know it's something we sort of have to walk through so I'm assuming then that you were diagnosed then with PTSD at some point from your childhood uh, okay complex yeah. Okay. And what was that like to work through that? Did that accompany your writing as well um, when you started writing the memoir or were they two kind of separate issues? Do you still have flashbacks or would you say you've healed from the PTSD? That was like a six part question, but. <laughs> uh, let me unpack it. Um, yeah. I, okay, I found that's a great question. So I thought that I had unfolded pretty much most most of the little skeletons hiding in there. And I thought maybe the cobwebs were even like swooshed away. I thought, oh, this is great. Until um, when I decided to write my book. And as I started to write my book, it was very different. I think writing through trauma mm -hmm. is traumatizing. Um, 
or it can be traumatizing. It was traumatizing for myself. And I think it's because um, as a survivor, I had to describe things and I didn't go, I had to choose like how much do I want to share? How much do I not want to share? How do I protect my readers so that they could finish the story? So it was a very, very different thing. So I had to write everything out and then describe it in detail so that someone could envision it. And then later on pick, okay, that's too much information. How do I describe, you know, like the, yeah. What was, you know, what was the setting of the room? Was it dark? How, where was my pain in my body? What was I feeling? What was I hearing? Um, and I think in that, when you're writing in such detail um, and trying to be authentic, I tried to show um, really like what my mindset was like as a 16 year old. And I was very open and um, childlike, I think. And so to really put myself in that situation, I would almost even meditate to try to find and then journal and write. And that I found traumatizing um, so much where uh, my husband said, you, you can't do this. You're going to actually make yourself sick and you got to stop doing this. And I kept on thinking like, you know, this wasn't about, this is not about me. I mean, This is not like a fun conversation, but I just kept thinking about myself. So I lived in Spain. I had no resources. I didn't speak the language. I couldn't go to the local library to look up any information. And at that time, there were only um, uh, therapeutic um, information that you could you could uh, get from the library. And um, it was kind of hard. They just didn't write a lot about it. And then any kind of books on it, they were, um, oh gosh, traumatizing stories. And that would just make me make make it worse mm-hmm. for me. And I wanted to find something where somebody made it through. And what are the things that they, how did they make it through? I wanted hope. I wanted um, just like uh, some basic tools and I couldn't find anything. And that always gave me the idea. So here I am in Spain and I thought, well, okay, I got to find my own tools. I got to make this up, like what works for me. And so that's how I started um, with my journey. And I also give give that information on the back of my book, the, the, the tools that I used as a kid. And actually they're the same things that I've learned in therapy and, but yeah. they're a lot more sophisticated and um, they've evolved. And basically it was um, visualization work. Um, what else? Um, I did a lot of pa- uh, picture boards where you would take out things from magazines and I would try to envision a different life. I wrote a lot. Um, uh, what else did I do? Um I had words that owned me. So um, because I was in school and I was having these flashbacks, so I was kind of failing at school. And I had a lot of words like, uh, you're stupid, you're dumb, um, Mm. you're ugly, because I couldn't stand who who I was. Mm. And I would have these words, and I would actually write them down, take them into the shower almost every day, take them in the shower in a felt pen, watch the words just melt off my piece of paper. And I would envision those words coming out of my, off my body that I didn't own them. I might've had to do it the next day, but that was just a constant thing. I was doing mantras and anything to change my mindset of who I was. And I would repeat it hundreds of times just to find something that I liked about myself or have a different mindset and try, um, it made me a very unusual ch- a teenager, let's just say, but nobody, <laughs> yeah. kind of funny, but nobody really knew that I was going through this stuff because I was never expressing it. And I asked around now still at some um, friends and they were like, no, you just seem normal. So you can hide it pretty well. Um, but I was considered spacey Cindy. So I'm sure that was a lot of it was just dissociation and going someplace else. I think I struggled a lot with that during my teens. Were you diagnosed with a disassociative disorder? Did you have any type of, well, it used to be called multiple personality, but now it's disassociative, disas, DID or whatever. (laughs) Did you find that you struggled with that or more just sort of going away? 
Uh, I would call it vacation. I would take a vacation. Yeah. yeah just like kind of going away. I realized, mm. um, I didn't even know what it was, but I read about yeah. it and I think my yeah. whole world stopped. I was like, what dissociation? I, oh my goodness. Um, that was a big wake up call. And I think in knowing what it was, I was trying to be more cognizant of staying present. But I think um, trauma, just what I would have trauma or any, I'd watch anything. I would just kind of like going, oh, well, and I would just daydream. That's what it felt like. It was just daydreaming. And then I would yeah. check back into like what's going on. But um, no, I didn't really, I wasn't, I didn't get a diagnosis of that. Mine was uh, post-traumatic stress. And when I was writing, I went through a lot of that all over again. And I was just stunned that Sometimes there are cobwebs in there that you just, you thought that yeah. you cleared away. Yeah. Well, and those are actually, our, our brains are incredible in how we cope and how we survive. And that disassociation is what saved you, you know? Absolutely. And so it's a normal reaction. Do you find you're a lot more aware of it now? Like they call those kind of, you know, disassociating or, or triggers where maybe someone reminds you of your father. So all of a sudden you're, oh, you know, are you kind of uh, cognizant of those things now? Um, I don't really seem to get a lot of this anymore. I've worked past it. Yeah. Also, um, writing the book, um, I started doing a lot more trauma therapy where it was really specialized to certain things. It mm -hmm. was um, bizarre. I just unfolded one recently, and that was um, cinnamon. I would eat um, not a blast of cinnamon, like a cookie, uh, like for Christmas. It was just like a hint of cinnamon. And I discovered this through my trauma therapist when we were doing... Um, it's the light work. What help me with that term again? Where you follow it? From oh, EMDR. Mm -hmm. EMDR. And so we did a session on that, and I tried to figure out like where did this come from? Yeah. And it was basically because when my dad would come into my room and molest me, there was a candle that was an artificial candle that had cinnamon in it, and oh. every time I would just take a. Uh, like of a hint of cinnamon was in some food, it would stop me and I would freeze and I, it drove me bananas and I didn't know what, what how, I, you know, you, sometimes you think these things are personality glitches or you just don't like something. And then when right. I went through that work, I was like, wow, like how much of the things do I do that are not my personality that are just hidden little things in, from my past. And um, I found that to be fascinating. But I could eat cinnamon now, so I'm all good. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you, how did trauma influence your relationships around you as you got older? And we're still working through some of this stuff. I think, um, you know, maybe you could help me through this. That's a really, thank you. <laughs> Great. Let's do a therapy session here. Um, so I found I was also a very social person. Um, uh -huh. I'm an I would consider myself an introvert, but um, socially, I've always been okay. And um, so I never really had an issue with that. I bonded very closely to my mother. So I do have true. I can bond and I have true love. I had a, a loving, loving relationship with my mother. So um, yeah. in that way, it's it really helped me. However, I, um, I always struggled with the betrayal part of it. And then mm -hmm. in that, um, <coughs> trusting adults um, and getting worried about being betrayed, I think yeah. is still an issue that I struggle to this day. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know, I don't know how, like sometimes I get into trauma loops a little bit with the betrayal mm -hmm. where they kind of cycle back and I have to stop myself. It's a hard one. I don't know. I, that's, that's the part where I kind of always tell myself there's not a magic wand. There's not a, yeah. a magic bullet. There's no pill. And so how do I, how do I find a different way to, uh, a different source of therapy to help me with that. And so I'm kind of like on a quest for that right now. 
That's a hard one. And I think it just to it, it comes back to that early development where the people we loved and trusted, they did betray us. And so sometimes when we get afraid of that, it becomes for me, it's always I have to go, okay, that was maybe true then, but is it true today about this person? Or is it true? Like what's true today versus then, you know, and sometimes that uh, is a process, you know, because <laughs> we can just feel like almost that that triggered back to that time, you know, and, and I've experienced this with the, with the father wounds and looking at, you know, the male authority figure and then saying, okay, is this person, you know, he's, he puts his pants on one leg at a time. He's, he's not my dad or, you know what I mean? And so we have to just remind ourselves that, okay, I'm a grown adult woman. I'm not five. And this person is, is, you know, what may have been true then is not true today. Right. But it's, it's, it's hard, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So that is something I still carry to this day. And, but uh, flashbacks, no. Um, uh, I am on an antidepressant, but um, I don't know. I kind of think most of the world is at this point, especially after COVID. Yeah, yeah. Well, and there's a, there's a great time for medication. I mean, it does wonders. It helps to reset our brains, you know, um, because, right, if, if our brain, you know, I mean, when your brain's wired for trauma, it, it impacts all the levels of dopamine, of serotonin, of all those sorts of things, because that's just, I mean, if you think about when you were experiencing that abuse, your brain was forming, like it was forming. Right. And so it forms <laughs> that way. And so we have to re rewire our brain a lot of times. And that takes time. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it, 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 it definitely can be stigmatized. But I always think that's silly, because, um, you know, it's it's helping you live a better life. And that's super important. Talk to me about your relationship with your dad. Now, I, I heard that you had contemplated killing him. Um, <laughs> so yeah. what what has that been like? Is he still with us? Did you confront him? My understanding when I was watching you on another podcast that you had done that and what what happened there? Um. Well, okay, so um, when I, so this was before 10, I'm, I'm going to guess here because it's in these ages, they were, it was all a blur. It was mm -hmm. seven, eight, nine, I'm going to say somewhere in there. Um, I contemplated killing my dad and um, basically because my mom, my sister were complaining about him all the time and I kept on hearing them like he needs to be stopped. He's just this horrible person. And I was thinking, well, I haven't shared my story with them, but I was thinking, well, yeah, I, I need to stop him. And I didn't want to involve my sister, my mother in the story, because then if I did kill my father, then they would have to go to jail too. And I didn't want that to happen. So um, I would practice um, killing my father um, in my mind different ways and just to stop him so that this would never happen again to myself or to anybody else. Yeah. Uh, rat poisoning. I thought, well, gosh, if I stick that in some tea, maybe he'll drink his tea or his coffee. Um, but then I thought, oh boy, my sister would, you know, she'll drink the tea. She used to sip tea and coffee at the end of the, the table yeah. all the time. And I thought, oh no, my sister could get hurt. And um, my mom and my sister would crack jokes. I mean, it's a, it just shows you how dysfunctional it was. They would, we would sit around and talk about ways about killing my father. And they were like, oh, maybe we could drop, bring the toaster in the, the bathtub <laughs> and just like, just horrible things. I mean, like very, very dysfunctional. Um, anyway, I, I took the cutlery um, from the kitchen and I thought maybe about stabbing my father and I brought a pillow into, hid the cutlery in the room, a, a knife my, in my bed, and then I would practice stabbing my pillow thinking it was my father coming in at night. And um, But then I realized that I had ribs and I, I, it was dark, I couldn't really see, and plus I 
had a butter knife because we weren't allowed to play with sharp knives. So right, I, it was right. a butter knife too. So that was just a bad idea. And I remember my mom saying, Cindy, what is all the cutlery doing behind your bed? Because I kept on taking a knife after a knife and it just didn't happen. So, I mean, I, I felt very, very trapped. And yeah. later on, what changed me from not doing something worse, I think I had, uh, it was basically an epiphany that I was scared that yeah. I had become just like my father. Um, I was just as angry. I started repeating the same things he said. I was started using the same tactics that he used. And I thought, oh my gosh, I am my father. Like I am, I have become the monster that I've been trying to run away my whole life. So um, that that was one part of it. And then later on, when I did confront him, I, he never admitted who um, what he had done. Um, I had to be true to myself. I always kept in contact with him, but I had mm -hmm. a lot of boundaries with my dad. He was able to come into the house only to the kitchen table. He was um, not allowed to go into the kids' bedrooms. And mainly because um, it was word his word against my word. Sometimes I felt like I was crazy. Did this really happen? You know, I was, it was such yeah. a hard journey for me. And to leave him and never talk to him again was more energy for me. So I had to be true to myself and my kids kids. I didn't explain it to my kids just yet. I explained it to them in different ages where I felt that they could understand what, what had yeah. happened in the past. And they were all like, oh, that's why you won't let us be around him. Or, oh, that's why he can't go into our bedrooms. Or, oh, that's why he's so strange. And so it kind of made sense to them, but I could only tell them at certain times. And um, Later on, when he became elderly, I ended up taking care of my father. There was nobody else to take care of him. And in this process, I put him, it was all about me. I put him for convenience sake. I moved him about like um, five minutes away from my house because I would mm -hmm. have to go back and forth. And in that process, he said, well, I had to ask. I've always been a truth seeker. I asked, I said, so dad, why did you do this? And he was already in his 80s. And um, he looked at me and referred me to um, a duck in the water, which I thought was just very bizarre. And he said, basically, his analogy was that um, I was like the duck. So you could pour water on me and I would always continue to float. And he said that he really resented that um, about me. He also shared that he was raped um, by soldiers in the war. Oh, and oh um, then he retracted that later on. But um, in that, um, I found it so fascinating. I thought, oh, okay, now I have to write this book that I've always wanted to write. So then I actually am interviewing him and... Um, and he agreed to do the book and he felt that it would help somebody else. He also felt that, well, I don't know about this, but this is my belief. I think he felt that it was, um, I'm very spiritual. So I felt that it was sort of, he knew he was going to pass and maybe that this was a, yeah. a deed or maybe it would make this horrible wrong a right by giving somebody else and list so that they could listen to the apology. So I did record my dad and I do have him in audio and wow. Um, but the weirdest part about that, I have to tell you, Jody, I don't think I ever really I thought I needed the apology, but it it wasn't the apology. I think I realized that I always had um I never really realized that I, I was the one who was the person who had to heal in that. Like I always had the the power to heal. I just didn't recognize that that the apology would do nothing. And it wasn't even the right apology I wanted to hear. Right. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So he did confess in, in mm -hmm. the end, in a sort of indirect way, it sounds like. Yeah. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Your story reminds me so much. You probably don't know Joyce Meyer, but she's a wonderful, she's actually a Christian evangelist, but she, um, she's got, oh, 
tons and tons of books. And anyway, she's wonderful. But her father um, sexually abused her. She talks about it a lot. And she also took care of him. <laughs> so um, it's, yeah, you two have a lot in common. So you'll have to look her up. Mm -hmm. Joyce yeah. Myers. Joyce okay. Meyer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Meyer. Meyer. Okay. I will Emmy. Look her up. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, did you, how did forgiveness play a role in your healing, forgiving your family? It did. It, um, I have to say, before I go into that, I think healing is um, very complicated. Um, also, just coming from a dysfunctional family, it, we yeah. all go through it differently. And um, just dysfunction in general, it, it plays havoc on every person in the household. It's not just, it, it rips through every soul in that yeah. household and it affects everybody differently. And um, yeah, they I liken it to like a kaleidoscope where with I mean, all yes. the little hanging, like one thing affects this and that and that and that, and, you know, just the the dysfunctional codependent family dynamics, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I want to preference whatever, whatever I did, it worked for me. And yeah. what other people did or didn't do, it worked for them. And I think all family members have to be... Um, supported in their decision of doing what works right for them. And it doesn't mean that you can't change that scenario. You could still change that. But for me, um, I, I wouldn't, it's, it's a very confusing thing about forgiveness. I wouldn't say I forgave him for the act of what he did. I yeah. forgave him um, kind of like in my heart, like I don't carry um, that toxic weight that I used to have. And yeah. I talked to him about that. Um, and I think that's what I let go of. And as soon as I let go of that, just heavy burden that I used to blame myself. I mean, it's, it, it was a whole evolution. Um, yeah. It just moved on. And in that process of talking to him, it wasn't just a straightforward forgiveness, but it was forgiving, forgive, mm -hmm. We forgave. He did too. He apologized. And, and it wasn't the right thing that I wanted to hear, but I, I recognize it's his apology, not the one that I wanted to hear. Um, I had to write my own apology. So what I wanted to hear. And so, yeah, I forgave him and I'm not, um, and I took care of him to his final years because it worked out for me and forgiveness yeah. is a process. And if you don't want to forgive, then that's your journey. It's your decision, but it is a very, very complicated, um, individual process. Yeah. What they say, you, on that? huh? Um, well, so as a, as a Christian person, you know, they say, you know, you've forgiven someone when you genuinely want what's best for them. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's for me how I always know when when the resentment stops. And so whenever that that happens, like and it takes years sometimes, it's not like it's like it's a choice where you say, I choose to forgive. And then I wake up the next day and I have to choose to forgive again. And then I wake up the next day and then I just pray for them and I pray for them and I pray for them, even though I don't want to and it's very hard. And then pretty soon your heart will line with the mind. So mm -hmm. so it's it's um the, the heart doesn't come first, the mind comes first. So we always get it backwards. So we have to make a choice. We do it eventually the heart lines up, you know, and then once, once I wake up and I'm actually happy if the person's doing well, even though they betrayed me, then I know I've forgiven them. And it, it takes a long time. So I think, I think even though our heart doesn't always want to, I think when, when we make the choice, we're kind of already there. It's just like healing, you know, we, we've made the choice we're going to heal. And then it's, it's the sanctification. It's a whole lifelong process, you know? Uh, and so what do we talk about? You must forgive. It's like, well, yeah, but 
you make the choice and over the lifetime you get there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which it sounds like you kind of went on that that same journey where you didn't wake up every morning and, and you know, the anger became less and less and you didn't no longer wanted to kill him. And then it was just neutral, you know, and then in the end you kind of, okay, I love you, dad, in that way. And, and I, you know, you kind of make peace with it, you know. Right. And I think what it was, um, I think I just made peace. I thought, well, like, um, you know, if a dog, if a dog got hit on the side of the road, I would pick up the dog, even if the dog bit me, I would take it and take the dog to go get services. I kind of thought about that. You know, you always have to put yourself in different shoes and try to think about it. And I don't think I could have lived with myself if I didn't take care of. Yeah of a human being. And that's the way I looked at it. And I thought, you know, he stunk, but he, I, I'm going to get him some medical care. And that's, yeah. and I have to be true to who I am. And that's, yeah. that feels right. And it resonates right with my body. And I don't regret that. And I, I feel it was a, the right decision to make for myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have to do what you can live with. That's what um, one mom told me whose whose mother had passed from alcoholism. And, and, you know, it really actually helped me because there's all this advice on things that we should and shouldn't do. But in the end, you have to do what you can live with. And you were also healthy enough to integrate back in with your father. And and that's a huge piece too, because a lot of, a lot of times we have to remove ourselves from the family and from the dynamic because it's too, too, too triggering. Especially if you turn to an addiction, you go back into that sick system, you'll start drinking again or using drugs or whatever. But once you heal enough, now you can reattach in a safer way. Right. And so you were able to do that when you were ready and that's totally okay. You know? Mm Mm-hmm. I like the way you said that. That was great. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about your work now. Um, The statistic, what are some of the statistics on sexual abuse in childhood and why are they so high? So tragically, there are one in four girls, one in six boys here in America. And um, every time I say it, I cannot, I still feel like, it still leaves a little pit in my stomach, even just knowing that, um, because those are reported cases, and yeah. um, so we know it's very, higher, very, probably. it's very, very sad. I think it's epidemic in our country. Um, yeah. There's we have a broken system. Basically, if you go to a therapist and you report what happens, then they often take you into foster care, you know, or the parents removed, and my. My mom's greatest fear was that she wasn't, my dad would threaten me. He said, if you tell, um, you won't have a roof over your head. And you know how much your mother wants to have a roof over your head. And if you tell, you don't want to have your, you know, the shame of our father. And, you know, we come from a great family. You don't, you know that. And so then it was all this stuff. You're going to be removed from the school. You're not going to have the same friends. So those are the things that locked me. And my mom, I think a lot of it was the financial part that locked her. She was terrified of supporting a family on her home Mm. on her own and being a single mom um and i know that because she expressed that so um that was her fear and unfortunately we have a lot of broken systems and a lot of these things you know can resolve or can't be resolved and i really hope that someday that we can talk about sexual abuse, sexual assault, I mean, all of this so commonly as we talk about drugs and alcohol, where um, if I think back, you know, way back in the day when I was a kid, um, you know, about a divorcee, you know, they're like, oh, you know, the lady down the street, the divorcee and how taboo it was, or, right. oh, um, uh, you know, so-and-so drinks, you know, three six packs at the end of the evening, you know, like, oh, hush, 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 very taboo in the the neighborhood. And they could be an alcoholic. But I mean, we just didn't talk about these things. But for some reason, 
when it comes to sexual abuse, um, we still don't talk about it. And I yeah. honestly think it's because um, it's uncomfortable. We don't talk about money. We don't talk about um, our sex life in, you know, in general. That's very private. And I think it's um, – we don't want to out another family member because it, it destroys – lives but what really happens behind closed door it destroys generations it yeah. creates health problems there's a lot more to it and um and until we're able to talk about this more frequently and find ways to fix our system and will people be able will we be able to find um some kind of resolution. And I'm really hoping that's my goal is to just keep an, and continue to talk about um, sexual abuse and help others that have survived and kind of make it a commonplace um, to talk about sexual abuse. So that's yeah. kind of my goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it is, it's the secrecy as to why those numbers are so high as well in, in many ways. There's a great book you'll have to read. It's about addiction, but it's called Lost in the Shuffle, The Codependent Reality. And it's by a guy by the name of Robert Subby. And I, I, I smile because he kind of, it's, it's, it's funny, but at the same time, it's so real. And it just, it, it just talks about the rules. There's all these rules in the codependent family dynamic, you know, don't talk about sex, what stays, what stays under this roof, you know, what happens in the family stays in the family, do as I say, not as I do, don't rock the boat. Like there's all all these things and you see it go from generation to generation but in that stuffing of feelings and in that dysfunctional coping comes dysfunctional coping skills like alcoholism and trauma and bulimia or whatever you want to call it and you just see it roll from generation to generation that's why they say the addict and the codependent are the same people <laughs> right it's all the same stuff and it just keeps rolling until we're able to see it and break the cycle. And that's really what you're doing with writing about this and overcoming all of that. So that is what's awesome. So I commend you for that. Um, talk to me about your book, a little bit more about what it's about and how people um, can get it and all that stuff. Actually, if you just put my name in there, Cindy Benezra uh -huh. or cindytalks.com or www.cindytalks.com, it'll pull up the information and I am on every possible, I'm selling my book there. So but yeah. Amazon's probably the safest place to go. Yeah. Okay. And then, so, so you have the Cindy Talks, what's that all about as well? Is that a podcast um, or YouTube or, or what, when, what kind of stuff do you talk about? So in there, it, it's, so I have a blog and uh -huh. um, I write, Oh, right. Okay. So it's a blog, right? That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. It's a blog. And it, that's where also, that's like my main focus. But um, mm -hmm. in the blog, I have different videos. So it shares, it's a place where you could just go and get like the YouTube videos and mm -hmm. social media, that, that type of thing. But I have a blog and I highly encourage others who have walked a similar, similar path as I have. Um, and you don't have to be a sexual abuse uh, victim, or I hate that word victim. You don't have to be a person of, you know, who has survived sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. um, it's really any form of trauma because it's that form of, it's that, uh, form of trauma dysfunction that um, kind of destroys lives. And um, we're all, if, if you've walked that path, there's a lot of similarities to it. Um, and we're all, t I think you have to lean on somebody else to kind of hear their story and go, how did you do this? Or what did yeah. you do? Or yeah. what type of therapy? Or where are you getting your inspiration? And I think that it's a place for that. So um, that's kind of what Cindy Talks is about. Awesome. And the book is called Under the Orange Under Blossoms. The orange blossoms. Okay. And you're wearing yeah. orange. I love that. And I'm wearing orange. And I have to say, so I used to run away um, all the time to the orange blossoms as a kid because um, I just thought I, I lived in a house of crazy. So I would run yeah. away to the orange blossoms because it was quiet. And 
I would look at the trees as my role models. I know that sounds just the most bizarre thing. Mm. It's because they, I could trust. They had a purpose. They, um, they were flooded. They were fed. They produced beautiful fruit. Like everything smelled fragrant. Um, it was a place that I could escape, sort of like a sanctuary. Yeah. And I tested nature more than I did um, people around me. And so that's kind of um, why I called it Under the Orange Blossoms, because that was a sanctuary that I would run away to. It, it helped you. It saved you. It was therapeutic. That's wonderful. Nature is so therapeutic. I love nature. And anytime I can be in nature, I'm in nature, you know. <laughs> um, so for people that have survived sexual abuse, trauma, any type of abuse, what's kind of some parting thoughts, advice, words of wisdom for them and their journey to healing? I want to say that you are not alone. You will get through it. Um, there is hope on the other side that you're worthy of being loved and you are loving us. And you have to remember that, um, that you are worthy of being loved and there's hope. Yes. And there's mm -hmm. so much help. So mm -hmm. definitely seek help. And like we talked about, remember, like you have the right to find the right help and the right therapist for you. There's so much help out there. And so definitely, definitely reach out to others and reach out um, for help and reach out to Cindy. Do you have a website? I do. It's uh, www.cindytalks.com. Okay, cool. Cindy, thank you so much for coming on and just sharing your story, your journey, your book, your healing tools, all that. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're very inspiring. I, I listen to your podcast. It's great. Thank you so much, friends, for listening to Genuine Life Recovery, playing on your favorite app or on my website at jodystevens.org. It's J-O-D-I-E-S-T-E-V-E-N-S, jodystevens.org. There you can check out my podcast, blog, recovery coaching info, speaking, and more. Check it out.